big things for you right now in that you have scored a great acclaimed series on Netflix. How did that one come about? I was able to get a meeting at uh, Warner Brothers, and while they were still talking to composers, and they they gave me a, a script for the first um, episode, and they asked me to make a what they called a musical mood bo- mood board of sorts, uh, just sort of based on you know they wanted me to just deliver sort of a demo uh, on the project and um, based on that first script. And I I spent uh, about th- just three three days or so before I had to, had to go on the road um, and basically gave them what my, you know, various cues, uh, so quote unquote, uh, uh, inspired by the, by the script. And uh, then I delivered that went on the road with it was either James Taylor or it could have been my my trio I think it was just a, it was a, it was a, it was a tour with my trio and they reached out to say they they'd like to talk to me through Skype and and uh that they really liked what I gave them for this music for this mood board and that was pretty much how it started and the film score has you showing your chops in a few different genres. Some people know you as a jazz guy. Other people know you as being able to play with singer-songwriters. Was it a particular genre that really got you this gig? I'm not sure, but I think it did help. It did help that I was that my background was jazz. And, um, you know, when we started talking about some of the period music that would be needed for the film, for the scenes that had bands and such uh in you know around 1910 or so i think that was a plus to them and and the first stuff that i did for them was the pre-recorded music uh that is the music for for scenes uh for live scenes and um where they needed to have the music before they before they uh you know filmed the, the scenes in toronto so i wanted to do a really authentic job of that in terms of, uh, you know, I researched, you know, pretty, pretty thoroughly in terms of, even though I, my jazz is my sort of love, this is a very specific time. It's ragtime, early jazz. And uh, I did have to consult some people who really were specialists in that, in that field. And, and the band that I got together uh, was for, or bands that I got together for those, some of those scenes weren't my usual calls that around town. I did, I, I had to get some recommendations for people who really excelled in early jazz, and I'm really glad I did that. And uh, so that I think that did help. And that once, since that was the, those were the first uh, musical pieces that I put together for them, they were really into that. And so I think I was in a uh, on, on good foot on a good foot with them um, from the start with that. Although the score itself was not to be. Um, overtly jazzy. They didn't want a jazz score. Um, um, but I found that since I really, in my head, I, I had this concept of of sort of uh, subtly um, making references to the era musically, that did play a part in the, in the more dramatic pieces of the score. Right, and the score and the music itself came out a couple of weeks ago through Water Tower Music. Is that your first real official score release? It sure is. It sure is. Yeah, and what was great was that uh, once uh, when Water Tower said, "Let's do this," they they basically let me put it together and 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 choose from the score what I wanted. I also extended some of the some of the uh, shorter cues that were that were very important cues, uh, particularly some of the more kind of backbeat, um, modern sort of uh, uh, combinations of sort of sort of hybrid jazz, hip hop kind of cues. Um, my friend Abe Abraham Rounds, um, who's a wonderful writer for TV, he's been working with Michelle Nadeghio Cello on some just on some projects in general, but also on some television. Um, he was really important in collaborating with me with some of those hip hop, uh, kind of, um, uh, cues. And, uh, at any, at any rate, we, we were able to sort of, 
um, uh, extend some of those so that they were a little bit more lis- listenable, you know, soundtrack context. And then that just, just became super fun because I was actually, as an artist, I was actually on Warner Brothers in the 90s as a, as a keyboard player. And it was just really cool that to once again be on a, uh, to put something out on a major label, so to speak, and, um, and uh, to have them sort of give me this freedom to, to put, put it together. Like all of a sudden during this terrible pandemic, I had this wonderful project to put together and put out. And so it was really a nice, uh, a nice opportunity for sure. I remember seeing your name on the credits of the movie Dealing with Idiots. Was that the first movie that you'd really scored? Yes, yes it was for Jeff Garland. Yep. Did having that film in your credits lead to getting more scoring work? It definitely helped. But one of the interesting challenges that I've had was, has been to continue to do some of the road work that I want to do. Um, I mean, the film work, uh, when I moved to L.A., the, pro- the, the, the plan was to um, simmer down the, 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 the travel and do more do more work that I can do from home, such as film and TV. So the dealing with idiots thing was a, was a great, uh, opportunity. Still, I found that, you know, first of all, knock on wood. I mean, I, I have some wonderful gigs that, that take me on the road that I, that at this very moment in particular, I'm very sad that they're, that they're, they're, they're not there because of what we're all going through. But, um, so that's always been sort of a challenge in, in, in sort of being able to time whether I you know whether I can get these things done and um, and uh, but it did lead to some things but I but I guess what I'm trying to say is I still had commitments that were um, you know road commitments that made doing both a little bit of a challenge um, but actually uh, now I've kind of now that I have a sort of a team like a like a music editor of course who's always on a project and and an assistant who does a lot of um, technical work. Um, I, I actually was able to, I actually was up against that sort of uh, challenge on this film, self-made, and I was actually able to write cues while I was in and out of town. And um, it's amazing what technology will will enable you to do these days. Still, that's one of those things that comes up, you know, whether, uh, of course, now, uh, maybe my entrance into film, uh, the timing is interesting. I mean, uh, it's, it's something you, that is best done when you're home and when you're in town, but of course, you know, we'll see what happens with, you know, with Hollywood and getting productions back together. But, um, I did use dealing with it in it, dealing with idiots as a, as a calling card to sort of get me more work. And it did lead to some, but I have to say self-made is, well, self-made is the first series I've done, and um, and it's definitely a much bigger production than than dealing with idiots. But that dealing with idiots gave me some chops for sure, and um, in this in this field, and it was a great experience. Good to hear that the projects keep leading into other projects. And one of the things that you just mentioned is touring. You've been on the road for quite a few mm-hmm. years with James Taylor. I knew that you were on the road with John Mayer prior to that or maybe mm-hmm. concurrently with that, but what was the first sideman gig that you had after the Warner deal that kind of made it a career to be touring? Ah, yeah. Well, my first major sideman gig, um, let me think. Uh, well, my, 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 my very first, and this is before I was on Warner Brothers, uh, was John Hendricks of Lambert Hendricks and Ross, uh, for those who know sort of fifties jazz. And, but the stuff that was really taking me on the road at the time that I was also, you know, uh, out there as a solo, solo artist, uh, were all jazz, uh, people, uh, John Schofield being one of the main ones, great jazz guitar player, Maceo Parker, who James, was James Brown's uh, saxophone player, um, Jim Hall, great jazz guitar player, uh, Michael Brecker, there was a lot of, there was a lot of things. Uh, still to this day, 
uh, John Schofield and I uh, have a very uh, active musical relationship. He's he's always doing different projects, and and once in a while we'll put sort of semblances of his older bands together. And yeah, those would be the the, the main ones. James Taylor that 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 was before John Mayer, and that started in around 2000 when uh, actually a sort of a famous uh, he had been a staff producer at Warner Brothers uh, years ago, Russ Teitelman, uh, who was the producer on uh, on all, all the great Randy Newman records. And anyway, I, I I knew him pretty well in the '90s, and he got the call to do the James Taylor record called October Road in 2001, and that's the first time I I met James, and that led to me sort of getting that gig, and. Yeah, things have been very different since then. That was the first non-jazz. Um, it was the, certainly the first pop touring gig I ever had. Really, one of two. Uh, the John Mayer one was the second one, and that was a couple of years. Uh, and that was just within the last four or five years. But James has been a regular thing since two thousand or two thousand one. Right. So going through all these credits and. There's plenty of people that you didn't name that you've worked with. For example, you're on a recording by Beck, Nora Jones, Sia, etc. Mm-hmm. You've spanned the genres, not just jazz, not just soul, blues, R&B. But I do notice that there's never been a metal credit on your discography. Am I wrong about that? Or do you actually wind up playing B3 on a metal album sometime? That's a really good question. I'll have to rack my brain. Metal, I don't think, is part of my um, uh, part of my discography yet, but you're giving me a good idea. I bring that up because uh, the second Motley Crue album actually has keyboards buried in the mix, and a lot of those albums that were made in L.A. had keyboards kind of hidden in the mix. So I didn't know if you had mm-hmm. ghost done some tracks or something along those lines. That's <laughs> That's interesting. That's a good point. I have not, but I'm certainly open to it. And what I love about my job and and about my career is that, and living like living in a place like L.A. or New York, where I had been living, um, yeah. Once you get known in that scene, or at least the scene of of, of as a, you know a, a studio musicians, and as someone who is open to and um, well versed in a lot of styles, uh, boy, it just it just makes things really interesting. I mean, there was a year when I was there was a year where I was touring, uh, where I was hopping off a Jim Hall gig, like two weeks or three weeks with Jim Hall, one of the great, you know, very subtle acoustic, you know, fossil um, guitar players. I'd, I'd leave that tour and I'd go on a funk tour with Maceo Parker. And I sort of, sort of thought nothing of it. I just thought, well, it's on to the next thing that I, that I love to do. And I think from a very, as, as far back as I can remember, my, my, my listening anyway uh, to music has been totally eclectic. And I really don't, I'm really not super conscious of the differences between them other than the language that I need to use. And it, to me, it's all music. And if I like to do it, and I find it challenging and there's a, some way I can, I can input my own personality within those restrictions. Um, I'm cool. I'm, I'm, I, I find it all sort of a challenge that I want to try to take on. But not to say that there are, there are that, that every genre I I'm interested in. I mean, I wouldn't really be interested in something that's so pop that it doesn't really call for any, any personality. I mean, that's not interesting to me, but I really dig going between genres for different projects. It just makes, makes my musical life feel very rich. Well, two quick questions that are non sequiturs and then you are a free man. And the first one is since this coverage okay or part of the coverage, at least, is going up on the Jewish Journal. Uh, are there a lot of Jews in jazz that we don't know about? 
have there been kind of hidden identity Jewish jazz players over the years? Let me think about that. I mean, I do remember being surprised as, as a younger person <clears throat> when I found out that Stan Getz was Jewish. But I think most people know that Stan Getz was Jewish. I don't think he was a, you know, I don't know if, if he was a practicing Jew, but um, let me let me think about some other. There's some other people who I always suspected were Jewish, like Lou Levy. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was. And he was really, really there at the time of Charlie Parker and, you know, some really important bebop and post-bop moments. And although I don't know much about his life, I always suspected he was Jewish. And... Here's a really interesting fact. Uh, the great Willie the Lion Smith, talk about early jazz, um, great stride piano player, became a, an ordained uh, cantor. I don't know if you call it ordained. And he was a Jewish cantor, at least in his, older, his, his elder years. And um, I, don't, I don't know of any footage of him singing um, cantorial music, but Willie the Lion Smith um, embraced Judaism and apparently was a cantor. So I don't know if a lot of people know that. I definitely didn't know that. And of course, Peter Bernstein goes on that list. Well, Peter Bernstein. Well, there you go. I mean, um, I wasn't even thinking of more more people uh, like my contemporaries. There, there are certainly there are certainly lots of Jewish great Jewish jazz players who are more of my contemporaries um, and. Louis Armstrong, you might remember, was brought up essentially by a Jewish family, I think, and uh, for years wore a, wore a star of David because of his indebtedness to to that family that brought him up. So he always felt very connected to the Jewish faith. I didn't know that one either. Wow! Thank you for the information. So, yeah. yeah. In closing, Larry, any last yeah. words for the kids? <laughs> Stay safe, kids. You don't, you don't, you don't live forever, uh, although you may think you do. And just to be safe and be creative. And um, also, if you're bored, I'm developing a Patreon uh, presence, um, so people can subscribe to the things that I'm doing, uh, which are creative and educational and lots of things. And so you can. You can find me through Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And I've just, I'm, I haven't even launched it. I think today or tomorrow I'm launching this thing. And it will include uh, conversations with me about film, television, and about jazz and about harmony and this and that. So just wanted to get that in there. Outro.